last time we met, we were looking at, um, we got to um, modern literary criticism. which is the criticism of the 20th century. Because the modernist period is the 20th century. We talked about precursors to modernism. Like Charles Darwin, uh, Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx, and so on and so forth. And we noticed in all of this that modernism was marked by a cultural shift with past tradition. There was a cultural shift that destabilized existing or previous tradition. So modernism is usually marked by a radical break with tradition. Whenever we talk about modernism at the modern, modern period, we talk about how events and ideologies, discoveries, led to a total transformation of the human culture from what it was known prior to the 20th century. The destabilization in previously known institutions, human institutions, especially the conflict between science and religion, where science represents the modern period and religion, the previous tradition. It was in the modern period that people had doubts about the existence of God. It was in the modern period that people had doubts about the existence of God. People lacked faith in human civilization. People lacked faith in the progress of the human race because the events in the modern period seem to have taken human race backwards. And so people began to conceive of time as not being linear, as not moving in a progressive direction. In fact, people began to see time as cyclic, cyclical in the modern period. But all this while we were thinking that as we move forward in time, we we're actually going, um, making progress, leaving our past, our backwardness behind us, and going forward to a, a future that is better than the past, but only for us to get to the modern period and realize probably that we have been moving in circles that we've not made progress at all. Because what happened, in the early 20th century, suggested that perhaps human race was moving backwards in time. Or probably was going back to where they started. And of course, even as we speak, we still, some people have this idea that maybe one day we wake up and see ourselves in the Stone Age. Then the 20, 21st century, but we could wake up one day and realize that we've gone back to the Stone Age. Why? Because of uh, threats of sophisticated weapons that man has amassed. These weapons that, if they are released on the environment, it could have um, irreversible effects, devastating effects on humanity. Talk about the biological weapons. The time that was used in um, Syria, it's just re uh, released to the environment, and if I get sick, by just by breathing in the air, or you release a certain bacteria, 
um, certain um, bacteria into the environment, certain virus to the, into the environment, and everybody dies in the moment. So it is the same feeling that the modernists had, the modernists had in the early 20th century. When they had the perception of the apocalypse, that the world would end any moment. Because man, this progressive man, this man who thinks that he's better than other animals, has been able to build these dangerous weapons. It wasn't, they, they were not as dangerous as the ones we have today, the nuclear bombs, the biological weapons that we have today. And yet, it created so much havoc that people even began to doubt whether there was a God anywhere in the universe who cared about me. So that's what we're talking about. So because of that, because of these realities, the realities of the First World War, the killings, the kind, the scientific invention, human culture suddenly changed. Human culture changed in the sense that people began to shed their previous beliefs, especially religious faith. These previous beliefs are known as traditional beliefs, the way things were done. So it not only affects Whatever happens in the human cultural sphere affects literature because literature is a cultural signifier. Which is what? Cultural signifier. So it affects literature, affects literary criticism. Of course, whatever changes within literature will affect how literature is appreciate how it is criticized. And so all the all the postulations on modernist literature could be found in the term avant-garde. Be found in the term avant-garde. Be found in the term avant-garde. Avant-garde. This disrupt, uh, disruption are explained in the term, the term avant-garde, which is French, which is French, and means advanced guard, which is French and means advanced guard. So whenever we mention the term modernism, what another term that will come to your mind is avant-garde. The term that should come to your mind is the avant-garde. Why we mentioned the term? Modernism, if you think of the avant-garde, is a term used to describe a set of writers, modernist writers. A set of writers, modernist writers. A set of writers in the modern period whose writing broke 
away with tradition. They aimed to disrupt arts in terms of techniques. They changed their techniques. They found new ways of expressing themselves, new style, new manners of writing. And that's what avant-garde stands for. This explains why a key feature of modernist literature is experimentation in forms and techniques. Key feature in modernist art is experimentation. These authors sought out new ways of writing. The idea of literature was meant to be disruptive, to be different from the past tradition, to be different from past tradition. One of, the, one of the previous ideologies that modernism kicked against and opposed is romanticism. Modernism is opposed to romanticism. Modernism is opposed to romanticism. <clears throat> In fact, modernism can be seen as that which reacts against the ethos of romantic literature. This is because Modernist literature aims to be impersonal. Aims to be impersonal. Whereas roman romantic literature aims to be expressive. And when it is expressive, it's meant that it expresses the author's personality. Another key concept in modernism that relates to the avant-garde is making music. So we can say that modernism is a philosophical 
an artistic movement, philosophical and artistic movement, which began from the late 19th century through the to the early 20th century to the early 20th century you can specifically situate modernism from 1910 to the 1920s. In fact, to be situated from 1910 to 1930, when the Great Depression began. It was thought that the Great Depression could fail to modernist strides. Modernism was inspired by the rise of industrial societies. Modernism was inspired by the rise of industrial societies. Industrial societies are societies that are run by the existence of industry. as people's lives are regulated by the existence of industries, industries where they work and they are living and so on and so forth. It was inspired by the rise of industrial societies, the rapid growth of cities, the rapid growth of cities, the rapid growth of cities, the trauma of the First World War, and the, the scary nature of scientific invention and discovery. Modernism questions the progress of human civilization. Modernism questions the progress of human civilization. It called into question the ethics of science. So today we still have ethical issues in science. How can we be scientists and be human at the same time? How can we be scientists and still respect human beings at the same time? We question the ethics of science. Modernism also uh, questions the Enlightenment project. The Enlightenment project, which began in the 18th century. Modernist thinking also questions the existence of God. Modernist thinking also questions the existence of God. Modernism was marked by a rejection of traditional notions in arts and literature. Mm -hmm. 
marked by a rejection of traditionalism in art and literature. Marked by a rejection of traditionalism in art and literature. Marked by a rejection of traditionalism in art and literature. And it was marked by a greater favor towards experimentation in ideas, in techniques, and in form, doing things differently, doing things um, in new ways, doing things differently, doing things in new ways. In the novel, in the novel, in the novel, modernism brought about as um, the use of stream of consciousness because of the discovery of the conscious and the unconscious mind through the works of psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts like Freud, stream of consciousness. Because then people began to understand the workings of the conscious and the unconscious human mind. Going to discoveries in psychoanalysis. And stream of consciousness implies telling the story directly by having access to the character's flow of thoughts. Telling the story directly by having access to the character's flow of thoughts. As the, 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 the narrator has access to the character's mind and narrates the story from there. So the story becomes the mental processes of the characters. In the modernist novel, too, <clears throat> the characters are more individualized. Characters are more individualized. And they portrayed without moral judgment. They portrayed without moral judgment. In the modernist novel, we do not have heroes, but anti heroes. Frail characters who do not aim to be great, but just to live out their frailty. They don't, so they are not heroes, they are anti heroes. I mean that they are heroes, anti heroes are heroes without heroic attributes. There's nothing for us to admire in them. No courage, no bravery, as we used to know in the epic heroes. So these are anti-heroes. 
They are heroes, but they do not have the heroic traits. So the modern character is an anti-hero. The modern hero is an anti-hero. The author does not aim to judge them morally, but to present them as frail beings caught in the web of time. The modern novel is also realistic because it depicts life as it is. The modern novel aims to be realistic because it depicts life the way it is and depicts life in detail. Aims to depict in literature exactly what happens in the, the extraditory world. So most modernist novels are historical. They respond to history. In poetry, in poetry, modernism brought about the use of blank verse, the use of blank verse. Sorry, the use of free verse. In poetry, modernism brought about the use of free verse. For the first time in the writing of poetry, by the use of free verse. So free verse began with modernist poetry. Modernist poetry was also characterized by brevity in the verses, aims at the precise use of language to depict reality, did not aim to be decorated, aim to be short and straight to the point which is why modernist poetry is imagistic. Why modernist poetry is imagistic. Modernist drama aims to depict the meaninglessness of life. Modernist drama aims to depict the meaninglessness of life. It sees the world as a theater of absurdity. When, when meaningless things happen, the world as a theater of absurdity. Man's drama aims to depict the world as a theater of absurdities. Because life itself is meaningless and absurd. Because life itself is meaningless and absurd. So the characters live out that, that meaningless life, have meaningless conversation, and simply wait for what never comes. They have hopes, but the hopes are never realized. And then at the end of the day, they die. And then the process is repeated again. And then the process is repeated over and over again. So modernist uh, drama is anchored on the philosophy of the theater of the absurd. 
and existential. So we have the theater of the absurd and existential. In modernism, criticism branched into many different directions, and there were many philosophies of art. Modernism, criticism branched into many different directions, and there were different philosophies of art, different cultural art philosophies. For instance, you had cubism. You had cubism. The dancing. Futurism. Surrealism. And constructivism. Now, there were many essays put forward to account for, to account for modernism, modernist literature. But one really stands out, and it is that one that we want to use, because you see, in each of the uh, periods that we mentioned, we had one essay or two to account for that um, era. So we need to have one case to, to account for modernist literature, modernist criticism, right? And so the essay that we want to use to do that, to account for that, is tradition and individual talent. Tradition and individual talent. Tradition and individual talent by Thomas Stens Tradition, individual talent. Tradition and the individual talent. T.S. This essay was published in 1919. Tradition of an Individual Talent was published in 1919. And Eliot uses the essay to make sense of modernist of the modernist literary criticism. Which poem should be impersonal? Should be impersonal. Should be impersonal. In fact, it is this essay that justifies the art for art's sake. Justifies the art for art's sake, which is associated with modernist 
literary criticism. That literature is self-contained, has its own organic form. That literature is self-contained, has its own organic form, and should be interrogated as being complete on its own without needing another material to interpret it. That's what art for art sex is all about. Eliot begins this essay with the following words. Eliot begins this essay with the following words. There's a copy of the essay. If you are interested, you can always have it to read. In English writing, we seldom speak of tradition. Eliot begins this essay with the following words. Quote, in English writing, we seldom speak of tradition, though we occasionally apply it, though we occasionally apply its name in deploring its absence. In English writing, we seldom speak of tradition, though we occasionally apply its name, ITS, its name, in deploring its abs absence, in deploring its statements to justify the idea that tradition is normally used to show how the poet, the contemporary writer, the new writer has benefited from the writers and the works before him. Using this idea to justify how Contemporary writers benefit from past writers. Meaning that it is normally asserted that new writers would not have been able to write without borrowing from the writers who had gone before them, which is tradition. All writers stand on the shoulders of previous writers, and that is tradition. But then, the author has to assert his individuality. But then the author has to assert his individuality, which is what will make his work original. It is this individuality of the author that will make his work original. Otherwise, 
he will be accused of aping previous writers. Yeah. He'll be accused of what? Aping. Okay, you so say he writes like Achebe. He writes like Chirinka. That term, that expression can be positive and can be negative at the same time. It could show that the writer has the mastery of Achebe and Shenka. When it is positive, when it is negative, it could show, it could mean the writer does not have originality of style or thought, that he merely copies these um, older writers. For Eliot, his observation is that tradition has been used as a phrase of censorship. It's a phrase of censorship. As a, a phrase for reprimand. Phrase for reprimand. Phrase of reprimand. So for Elliot, the word tradition is usually used to reprimand writers. All right? To criticize writers for not being original. It is also from this essay that we have the idea that criticism is as inevitable as breathing. We have used this term before. It is taken from Eliot's traditional individual talent. Criticism is as inevitable as breathing. Meaning you cannot help but criticize. Pass judgment, evaluate, say something about it. The work of art. So what Eliot notices in the criticism of his time, in the existing criticism of his time, is that writers use the word tradition as a phrase for censorship. Right? Meaning that they prefer the writer to assert his individuality over aligning with tradition. And that is, that is expressionism. That's expressionist um, criticism. That is romantic criticism. Because romantic criticism is personal. It's expressionist. It's expressive. Okay. So Eliot states that when people praise writers, when people praise writers, they praise the writer based on the aspects of his work that are original to the writer. They want to press the writer's originality. The part of the writer's work that least resembles anybody else is what is to be praised. But Eliot says that this is a faulty way of establishing a writer's greatness.
Because according to him, even when you look at the most original part of a writer's work, you will still find that the writer owes a lot to tradition, even in that original part of the work. So it says, one of the facts that come to light in this process of a tendency to, in, um, one of the facts that come to light in this process is our tendency to insist when we praise a poet upon the aspect of his work in which he least resembles anyone else. We tend to look for originality in the poet, but then Eliot goes on to say, whereas if we approach a poet without this prejudice, we shall often find that not only the best, but the most individual parts of his work may be those in which the dead poets, by dead poets he means the tradition, the past writers, his ancestors have set their immortality most vigorously. So even in the most original part of a writer's work, you will find tradition asserting itself. That's what Eliot is saying. So tradition is powerful and difficult to set aside so easily. Eliot says that tradition cannot be inherited but gained through labor. Tradition cannot be inherited but gained through labor. Tradition is difficult to overcome because it is based on the historical sense. It is based on the historical sense. And it is also based on the perception of the past. It is also based on the perception of the past as that which is constantly present. It's also based on the perception of the past as that which is constantly present. So Eliot said this at the time when people believed that novelty was better than repetition. Novelty is better than repetition. So history is past. The past is constantly present. That is the idea of tradition and the historical sense. The historical sense also implies that the historical sense also implies timelessness. Timelessness. The historical sense also implies timelessness. So the historical sense is not necessarily what has happened in the past, but what 
happens all the time. Okay? What recurs? So Elliot is trying to let us understand how the past should relate with the present. And invariably how past writers should relate with present writers and how past work should relate with present work. It is, it is a give and take relationship and both are inextricably bound. In the way Elias sees it, the relationship is give and take, and both are inextricably bound. You cannot have a point where you demarcate the past from the present. The two coexist together all the time. So this leads Elias to make the following statement that no poet no artist of any art has his complete meaning alone. No poet, no artist of any kind, of any art, has his complete meaning alone. It is an insightful way of understanding literature because literature is understood through relationship. How one text relates with another and how one writer relates to another. In fact, meaning is generated through these relationships. Without this relationship, there will be no meaning in literature. No poet, no artist of any art has his complete meaning alone. The value that we place on contemporary writers is dependent on how we compare the contemporary writers to the ones that had gone before. So meaning can be realized through contrast, through comparison. Without that comparison, there will be no meaning in literature, even in life. So meaning is generated through relation. And the relation between talent and tradition. So the value that we arrive, derived from current writers and their work, depends on how we compare and contrast him with tradition. Even if you say that this work or this part of the work is original, you are saying that because you've been able to compare it to the part that is not original or to the ones that are not original, in quotes. That's why Elias says you cannot value him alone. You cannot value the, the contemporary writer Alone. You have to set him in contrast with other writers who had existed before. So I think this is um, this is this opens a vista on comparative criticism. There's something in Eliot's essay that gives us insight into the possibilities in comparative criticism. So Eliot goes on to discuss how new works and old works relate. New works and old works relate. The publication of a new work does not cancel 
the ideas expressed in old words does not even make itself better than the old words. Rather, what happens is that there is a simultaneous revision of the entire canon. Is a simultaneous revision of the entire canon once a new work is born. Entire canon. Once a new work is born. There's a simultaneous revision and revise a revision of the canon of literature once a new work is inserted. The canon revises itself and accommodates, accommodates the new work. This is how he puts it. This is how Eliot puts it. The new work modifies the existing works. And the order, the new work modifies the existing works and the order, order, O-R-D-E-R. -E the new work modifies the existing works and the order, but the existing order is complete before a new work arrives. The new work modifies the existing works and their order, but the existing order is complete before the new work arrives. The new work modifies the existing works and their order, but the existing order is complete before the new work arrives. So that defines the give and take relationship that exists between newly published works and the existing works. And also, that relationship is what? A give and take relationship, as I said. And that is found, that is seen in this expression. The past is altered by the present as much as the present is altered by the past. So that um, gives, you, gives you a sense of that relationship between the dead poet and the living poet. The past is altered by the present as much as the present is altered by the past. The past is altered by the present as much as the present is altered by the past. Eliot goes on to say that when Contemporary writers claim to be more knowledgeable than the past writers. I just want to state that when contemporary writers claim to be more knowledgeable than the past writers, they are erroneous. They are fallacious in their claims. They are fallacious in their claims because what they claim to be their knowledge, what they claim to be their knowledge is actually the knowledge, the knowledge of the past writers. They think they know because they know about the past writers. They know about what the past writers wrote, that study their work, and what they think they know better than those who had gone before is nothing but what those people have done and that work. Okay? And so this scene in the expression, the dead writers are remote from us because we know so much more than they did. 
the dead writers are removed from us because we know so much more than they did. Elias says precisely, and they are that which we know. That means we know past writers, and that could sometimes make us think that we know better than they did. But what is our knowledge, if not the knowledge of past writers? That's the argument, and you must follow the argument. It also says that the writer needs to have a public mind. The writer needs to have a public mind. This is what he calls the mind of Europe. The writer needs to have a public mind. What he calls the mind of Europe. And this public mind is separate from his private mind. This public mind is separate from his private mind. The writer's private mind. And should supersede the writer's private mind. Because the private mind is what we attribute to the romantic poet, who is hated in modernist crit uh, critique or criticism. So the writer has to sacrifice his private mind to have a public mind. The writer must shed his romantic sentiments and acquire an objective mindset. Elliot says that the progress of an artist is a continual self-sacrifice. That sacrifice is the sacrifice of the private mind. The progress of an artist is a continual self-sacrifice. It is the extinction of personality. The extinction, the annihilation of personality in order to acquire the public sense, the public mind. This is because modernist literature is marked by deep personalization. This is because modernist literature is marked by what? Deep personalization. Depersonalization. The idea that the writer should remove himself from the art, which is difficult, but which must be done as far as the modernist critics are concerned. The art has to be impersonal. The art has to be what? Impersonal. In keeping with the, science, the scientific ethos of his time, in keeping with the scientific ethos of his time, Eliot uses a science experiment to account for how the mind of the writer works. Eliot uses a science ex experiment to account for how the mind of the writer works in order to produce good literature, modernist literature. Analogy. 
This is done through analogy. In the following words. When a bit of finely filiated platinum is introduced into a chamber containing oxygen and sulfur dioxide. Is introduced into a chamber containing oxygen and sulfur dioxide. So this is a, a, a chemical reaction. This is chemistry. And Elliot wants to use this chemistry, chemical reaction to tell us what happens in the mind of the writer when a work is to be produced and how the work should be produced. How the mind of the writer should relate with his experiences in order to produce a timeless work of art. Elliot says, when oxygen, when oxygen, Elliot says, when oxygen and sulfur dioxide react with a filament of platinum, it results in sulfurous acid. When oxygen and sulfur dioxide react with a filament, of platinum, it results in sulfurous acid. Okay? That is a science experiment. I'll take that again. When oxygen and sulfur dioxide react with a filament of platinum, it results in sulfurous acid. This was the age of science. So we had to use science to demonstrate what happens in the arts, okay? So if you have taken down that statement, note that oxygen and sulfur dioxide represent the emotions and experiences that enter into the mind of the poet. The oxygen and the sulfur dioxide represent the emotions and the experiences that enter into the mind of the poet. into the mind of the poet. When oxygen and sulfur dioxide react with the filament of platinum, it results in sulfurous, sulfurous acid. And I say that oxygen and sulfur dioxide represent the emotion and the experiences that get into the mind of the poet as raw material for literary production. Because writers don't write in a vacuum. They write based on their experiences. And in the romantic literature, we glorify these experiences. And it should, in fact, inform the arts. But in modernist criticism, we are going for um, objective art, we are going for objective criticism, we are going for the personalization, impersonal um, artistic expression. And so the poet has to be able to modify his experiences, know how to relate with the experience in order to produce a work that distances itself from him. Now, in this reaction, the platinum is the catalyst. The platinum is the catalyst. The platinum is the catalyst.
So if you had an introductory chemistry class, you know that a catalyst is an, is a, an element that takes part in a chemical reaction, but it is not changed in the course of the reaction. The catalyst is an element that takes part in a chemical reaction, but remains unchanged at the end of the reaction. Okay. And the platinum is what the mind of the poet should look like. The platinum, the mind of the poet should be the catalyst in the in this whole reaction process in creating literature. I mean that the poet has to be able to manage his emotion so that he himself is not affected by the emotion. All right? The emotion passes through the heart and becomes a work of art, works of literature, but the poet remains unchanged, unaffected, unmoved. The poet remains himself, unaffected, and unmoved. So in this work, Tradition and Individual Talent, Elia proposes the impersonal theory of literature. Impersonal theory of literature. In Tradition and Individual Talent, Elia proposes the impersonal theory of literature, which is modernism, which, what, which is what modernism is all about, which is what uh, modernist criticism is all about, which is hard for us to all right? Art that is not based on the poet's emotion, that does not express the poet's personality, but is impersonal. It is what we talk about in formalism. He also proposes objective criticism. In talent and individual, in, in talent and individual talent, Eliot proposes objective criticism. So, in personal theory of art, just Distance his personality from his art. In the impersonal, in the impersonal theory of art, we test how the poet has been able to distance his personality from his art. And objective criticism, as we defined earlier, is text directed. Is text directed. It aims to examine the text and only the text to get its meaning. This is what Elias says in the essay, and I quote. This is what Elias says in the essay, and I quote. Honest criticism and sensitive appreciation is directed not upon the poet, but upon the poetry. That's objective criticism. Honest criticism and sensitive appreciation is directed not upon the poet, but upon the poetry. So objective criticism is text-only criticism. It's what? Text-only You carefully examine the text to generate meaning from it. Elias says that the more perfect the artist, 
the more completely separate in him will be the man who suffers and the mind who creates. So the man who suffers cannot and should not be the same as the man who creates. The experience should not change the poet in the process of literary production. Because the poet has to make his mind mature enough to handle these experiences without affecting him personally. All right? It's not personal. Don't take it personally. Don't take it personally. All right? You are being too hard upon yourself. So it is at this point that Eliot hits romanticism hard. It's at this point that Eliot hits romanticism hard. Remember that modernism hates romanticism. Modernism is opposed to romanticism. He says, emotions recollected in tranquility is an inexact formula. Emotion recollected in tranquility is an inexact formula. So in that one sentence, he just finishes romanticism. One statement, Eliot Eliot Carpet's Romanticism. Emotions recollected in tranquility is an inexact formula. This missing, this missing romantic criticism. And saying that in that no place. In modernist literary criticism. Because emotion recollected in tranquility is an inexact formula. Then it goes on to say that poetry. Poetry is not turning loose of emotion, but an escape from emotion. Again, that is not romantic at all. Poetry is not turning loose of emotion, but an escape from emotion. Poetry is not turning loose of emotion, but what? Escape from emotion. It is not the expression of personality. It is not the expression of personality. In modernist literature, you don't go to look for the person of the author in the text, because the none should be there. It is impersonal. So it's not the expression of personality, but an escape from personality. Literature is not an expression of personality. In the romantic tradition, it is. But in modernist tradition, it is not an expression of personality, but an escape from personality. And it goes on to say that it's only those who have personality that know how to run away from it, how to escape from it. It's those who have personality that know how to run away from it, how to escape. Okay, so that's where we end our class for today. When we come back, we move on to new criticism, which is a continuation of modernist criticism. And that will be tomorrow.